this agency that started in 2004. Uh, Philae was a robotic lander that accompanied was set up a, a spacecraft and it was supposed to perform the first soft landing on a comet with an unpronounceable <laughs> Russian name at the acronym is 67 PZG. So after 10 years of flight in space, when Philae left Rosetta heading towards the surface of the comet, the storyline became exciting and captivating like a thriller or an adventure novel. I remember sitting at the TV and following the events with adrenaline and, and tension. Professor Amaya Henrich will report on the mission, the results and the photochemical experiments under cometary conditions, providing similar compounds in the lab than those found on the comet. Uh, Monsieur, uh, je vous donne la parole. Maya Henrich? Ja, guten Morgen. Morgen. Sie hören mich, das ist ja schon mal gut. Prima. Guten Morgen und auch ich heiße Sie herzlich willkommen zur Foto. Uh, also, I would like to welcome everybody of you to the Photochemistry Lecture 2020, this year organized online, usually it was supposed to be organized in Kiel. I would like to also invite you to join me by landing a second time on the nucleus of Comet 67P, Shoryumov Gerasimenko, as we did with the help of the Rosetta mission of the European Space Agency and its uh, robotic lander, which was named Philae. So today, a second time, we will do this adventure. My presentation will be divided into two parts. The first part, will try to explain and to outline what do we expect as chemists, as photochemists from a mission to a comet, to a cometary nucleus. So I'm going to explain you what is a comet, how does it form, why is it interesting for chemists and in particular for photochemists. And in the second part, I would like together with you to land a second time on the cometary nucleus and to figure out the organic composition of the cometary surface material. Um, we would like to identify, to quantify organic molecules. We were supposed to uh, resolve enantiomers in between these molecules. And this, all this is what we're going to do a second time today. Here you see an image of a comet. It was taken in 1984. The comet is called uh, Hale-Bob. You recognize that the comet by approaching the sun forms tails, and this time two tails. The lower one is what we call the dust tail, which is curved, and the upper one, which you beautifully recognize on this image, is the type one tail, which is a plasma tail. The plasma tail is composed of ions and of electrons. And the blue color of the plasma tail is an emission line of carbon monoxide plus ions. The length of this plasma tail is several hundreds of millions of kilometers. Its color is blue due to CO plus. This means the cometary nucleus, which is supposed to be in this area, which will have a size, a diameter of a few kilometers only, contains a lot of carbon. This was reason enough for the European Space Agency to try to design a spacecraft, which will, which was called Rosetta, which is going to separate from a lander called Philae, and the lander was designed for a soft touchdown on the surface of this cometary nucleus to detect the uh, origin of this uh, carbon uh, containing molecules. 
So in the first part of this presentation, we would like to understand how does a comet form? What is it made of? What is the photochemistry involved? So here on the left-hand side, you see a model which was developed by Professor Mayo Greenberg from Leiden University. On the left-hand side, you do see a dust grain in brown color from interstellar space. Its size is smaller than a micrometer. We usually talk about a tenth of a micrometer. These dust grains are very well known. And in, in the gas phase surrounding these dust grains, in the gas phase, you have molecules such as carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, water, methanol, and other molecules. These molecules from the gas phase, which are also very well known from different types of spectroscopic observations, these molecules from the dust uh, from the gas phase are supposed to land to uh, condense on the surface of the dust grain by forming an IC layer. During the condensation, those molecules are irradiated. This irradiation here given in the middle image is a cosmic radiation, which is also extremely well characterized, illustrated here. And these ice layers of the condensing molecules during irradiation with cosmic rays growth in thickness. A cometary nucleus now is composed of an agglomerate of all these small dust grains, and each individual dust grain is surrounded by its individual IC layer. It was then supposed that photochemistry takes place in these IC layers triggered by cosmic radiation. And this is why on the right hand side, you see this um, IC layer in red color. In order to accompany the Rosetta mission and to prepare for this Rosetta mission, in our laboratory, we reproduced conditions of interstellar space in this uh, vacuum chamber, which is a UHV chamber. We use high vacuum. And we deposit molecules, those molecules that you know already, water, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, ammonia, methanol, under control condition on a support, which is simulating our dust grain. During condensation, those molecules are irradiated here with the, with the help of a UV lamp. We can uh, record infrared spectra in Z2. Here on the right hand side, you see the chamber. 18 years ago, we published then in Nature that the artificially produced cometary ices in the just shown gas chamber that were subjected to gas chromatography coupled to mass spectrometry contained a wide variety of organic molecules. And what you see in this chromatogram, all of these molecules are amino acids, such as alanine, glycine, aminobutyric acid, valine, proline, aspartic acid, serine. And here we have a, what we call new family of amino acids, which are di amino acids. These di-amino acids contain two amino functions and one carboxylic group. The chiral amino acids among those detected here, in total we detected to that time 16 different amino acids. The chiral ones were separated into their enantiomers. We observed a racemic ratio because there was no asymmetry sheet that was induced, that had been induced previously to our system. The Francophile people are now among you may know even the name of this first eluting amino acid. It is, according to our former president, called Sarkozine. And you well recognize it's the smallest signal in the entire chromatogram. Prior to publication of those data, because we knew these data would would accompany the Rosetta mission with a small revolution by assuming that the comets contain a wide variety, a big diversity of different amino acids. We wanted to be sure that all those amino acids detected 
uh, made visible in the gas chromatogram. They're really produced by the carbon one or nitrogen one atom containing ingredients that we had indu induced into the system and not by contamination. Therefore, we repeated the experiment a second time. And in the second experiment, we used carbon 13 isotopes in our carbon uh, containing molecules such as carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and methanol. And here in the first column, or in the third column in this, uh, of this um, table, you recognize for the amino acid lysine. In the carbon-12 uh, sample, the mass spectrum with the basic ion at 102, a molecular ion at 175. And in the carbon-13 sample, the molecular ion is at 177. And this is because glycine has contains two, uh, two carbon atom, atoms. So we see a mass shift in between the carbon-12 and then the carbon-13 sample that corresponds to the number of carbon atoms in the original amino acid. And this lets us assume that there is no doubt all those amino acids that were detected in our system have been produced photochemically by the um, reactants and they were not the result of contaminations. And this is, if you like, the scientific beauty or the scientific importance of our data because in our system we can vary a lot of different parameters to study in depth very carefully our system. This was not possible with data, of course, of the Rosetta mission. For example, we can change isotopic composition. We can change the energy of the incoming photons. We can change the polarization of those photons. We can modify the molecular composition of the initial gas mixture, etc. So a lot of uh, journals worldwide reported on our data. For example, Le Monde de Brique du Vivant does in Cosmos, uh, Artificiel. To that time, we obtained a lot of research funding. And this funding was then uh, invested into a new technique in gas chromatography, which is called multidimensional gas chromatography. Here you see now a chromatogram a gas chromatogram, this is a gas chromatogram of a standard mixture of amino acids. Very often you recognize that we have two signals. These two signals correspond to enantiomers because we use an enantioselective column in the first dimension. Today we use this uh, multidimensional gas chromatography to analyze the samples of interstellar ices, the samples of reproduced cometary nuclei. And we do see until today more than 30 different amino acids in those ices. And as you can recognize in this figure here, a lot of these signals have not yet been identified. And we suppose them, for example, this one, to uh, correspond to an amino acid as well. In the same IC samples, we do not only observe more than 30 different amino acids today, if we derivatize those ices accordingly, we do detect also a wide variety of sugar molecules, such as ribose. But not only ribose, ribose is accompanied by its sister aldopentoses, which are called xylose, arabinose, and luxose. So a short resume at this uh, moment already, in uh, anticipation of the Rosetta mission, we simulate artificial cometary nuclei in our laboratory. And in those samples, in the samples of these artificial cometary ices, we do detect a wide variety of organic molecules, including a big diversity of amino acids and of sugar molecules, including ribose. We are able, moreover, to resolve the enantiomers. So this is interesting because in interstellar space, as you can see in this image here on the right hand side, the photons that irradiate the forming comets are polarized, circularly polarized. So they are handed. We talk in the most recent publication about chiral photons. 
chiral photons exist in interstellar space. And we now adapt our experiment by going to a synchrotron center, in this case, to the synchrotron center in Paris, which is called Soleil, where our electrons are forced on a helical pathway by an undulator. We generate circularly polarized light. We generate chiral photons, different energies. They pass a xenon filter, a grading to select appropriate energies, a polarimeter to characterize the Stokes parameters of the circularly polarized light. And here, this part you know already. This is the part where we deposit C1 units and N1 units in our reactants from interstellar space. On the surface, they are irradiated with circularly polarized light. We run our multidimensional gas chromatography in an anti-selective mode and are able to separate enantiomers. Here depicted are the two enantiomers of alanine. The first eluting signal is L, the L enantiomer. The second eluting signal corresponds to the D antipode. So if we irradiate our sample with left circularly polarized light, we generate an excess of the L enantiomer. If we irradiate with right circularly polarized light, we generate an excess of the D enantiomer in the case of alanine, and uh, unpolarized light gives us the racemic mix. The enantiomer that we are able to induce does not only correspond on the helicity of the circularly polarized light, it also corresponds to the energy of this light. So you understand the situation and it's complicated. We have uh, not meteorites, we have uh, uh, cometary nuclei comets that form. And uh, on Earth, we do have two, two forms of life, plus and minus life, if you like. This was a cartoon depicted in the journal Le Monde in 2011. And you understand, of course, en bref, la vie sur Terre et la gauche. Yeah, this is uh, my introduction to get you uh, involved into what do we expect from the Rosetta mission. And now part two of the presentation. Let's directly jump into this uh, Rosetta mission. Here you see the uh, Rosetta orbiter. Solar panels span over 32 meters. The Rosetta orbiter has a size of two to two to three meters. On top of it, this is what we call the payload support module. And we will have 10 scientific instruments included in this payload support module. It's a European mission. Most European countries were involved also to develop a scientific instrument for the Rosetta mission. A lot of partnerships also, uh, as for example, ours in between France and Germany. You see uh, optical cameras. Uh, you see the Virtis camera, which works in the infrared infra infra range uh, constructed in Italy. And you see two Osiris cameras constructed at the Max Planck Institute for Solar System Research in Göttingen. There was also designed this uh, Philae lander, and Philae lander itself is also composed of 10 scientific instruments. We don't have the time to go into all those instruments. No. But believe me, nearly all techniques from analytical chemistry were involved, except maybe NMR spectroscopy and Raman spectroscopy. So here you have the uh, orbiter, three technicians that assemble the filler lander to the Rosetta orbiter. Here on the right hand side, the Virtus camera from the infrared, designed in Italy and developed in Italy. And here the two Osiris cameras from Max Planck in Germany. The filler lander is here with the three legs. The filler lander was supposed to separate from the Rosetta orbiter, to deploy the three legs, and to soft land on the surface of the cometary nucleus with a velocity of one meter per second. In 2004 was launch date. We now uh, skip a little bit in time. And we are in 2010, where for the first time, sorry, for the second time, we passed the asteroid belt. For the first time, the asteroid belt was passed in 2008. So uh, here, what you see is an asteroid, which is called Lutetia. Its diameter is 120 kilometers. And uh, all instruments of the Rosetta 
mission on Earth, which are not because we were interested in these Easter asteroid. The, the reason for that is just uh, for test purposes. So here you see a high resolution image of the asteroid Eutitia, and you recognize that all these craters were given names from the time that Paris was called Lutetia. Basilia, for example, you see this big crater here. Most beautiful crater is this one here, Nisa Ea, right? We then continued, and in 2014, we observed with the uh, near-angle camera from the Osiris uh, camera, our target comet, Shuryomokrasimenko. The comet nucleus, of Shuryumov Casimento as seen uh, in July 2014. And to our big surprise, and now you can, if you have a radar available via your 3D glasses, you can wear them on all those uh, slides where I put this image on the upper left corner. This was uh, one of the first images obtained in summer 2014 of our target comet nucleus. 67P showroom of Gerasimenko. And to our big surprise, you see that it is composed of a small lobe on the right hand side and a big lobe on the left hand side. An intermediate section, which is here, with a lot of uh, terraced formed terrain, uh, which was uh, extremely spectacular when uh, this form was recognized by these cameras for the first time. You can imagine that those teams on Rosetta that had instruments on the orbiter. For them, it was already, when they saw these images, a very big success story because they knew they had for the next 10 or 15 years sufficient work to do in order to analyze all these structures that you can see on this um, uh, morphology, interesting morphology on the surface. And I can tell you that those teams on the Rosetta mission that were on the Rosetta lander, Philae, they panicked because it was obvious that it will be difficult to land on this cometary nucleus. To that time, we even did not know whether the gravitational center of this cometary nucleus was inside or outside the form that you can see here. The North Pole is here in the intermediate section and it's a crater is this line here. The uh, Rosetta orbiter was developed with stereo cameras. So what you see here uh, are images not directly from the stereo camera, but from a shape model that was designed after images, original images. And then we can, uh, according to Matthias, rotate these forms as we want. On the right-hand side, again, you see the small lobe. On the left-hand side, the big lobe. This is the intermediate section. This is Hator. So all named, all surfaces was given different names. And Happy is the intermediate section. Here you have the impression that the intermediate section is in particular active. So what you see here is cometary activity. The comet, now in a distance to the sun of about three astronomical units, will approach sun to about 1.2 astronomical units. And during this uh, this trajectory, the cometary nucleus will become more and more active. And we, together with the Rosetta mission, will follow this activity, this increasing activity of the cometary nucleus, and thereby we will try to land on this structure. Here again, you see uh, this intermediate section of the cometary nucleus. Sorry, let's continue. You should know that we had to increase the luminosity, otherwise the cometary surface would have appeared as black in front of a black uh, background. The black color of the cometary nucleus uh, is related to the extremely low albedo. Uh, cometary nuclei are those uh, cores of the solar system with the lowest albedo. So if you send very few photons, uh, if you send light onto a cometary nucleus, only very few photons come back, which is about 6%. This is the part which is called uh, which is called Imhotep of the cometary nucleus. And there you see, uh, I put my first name here, which is Uwe. On this surface of the cometary nucleus, you see already written the U, the W, and with a little bit of imagination, I also see the E of my first name on this big of, uh, surface on the uh, biggest, bigger of the two lobes of the cometary nucleus. 
The commentary includes approach the sun becomes more and more active. Here you see an active zone. These active zones are ex extremely distinct zones on the cometary surface. Science made a special issue on the cometary nucleus. And here again, our comet becomes more and more active. The cometary activity increases. And we uh, approached our, um, our Rosetta mission, approached the cometary surface in a distance of five kilometers only. In this context, text, it is important to note that the Giotto mission, in 1986, which is also a space mission, which visited a cometary nucleus, the one of Comet 1P Halley, got its camera destroyed in the distance to the cometary nucleus of 1,500 kilometers. And here on our comet, you do see the reason why. The uh, camera of Giotto was hit, the lens of the camera was hit and broke in a distance of 1,500 kilometers. Afterwards, the Giotto spacecraft in 1986 passed the cometary nucleus in a distance of 600 kilometers. We don't have images from that time. The best images of the comet Giotto, of the comet Halley taken by Giotto, uh, were taken from a distance of 1,500 kilometers. And he, we passed our, our cometary nucleus in a distance of five kilometers only. The camera was uh, moved then into uh, the night site, into the cometary night moved by 180 degrees, and you recognize a lot of dust particles, all of them published in uh, science, more than uh, 300 dust particles. The uh, star trackers had difficulties to that time to identify the stars and to, uh, to control the trajectory of the Rosetta mission because we came too close to the cometary nucleus. The Rosetta spacecraft had to be moved to a distance of 1,000 kilometers four times to reboot um, the um, Star Trekkers, to reorient the Rosetta spacecraft on the three axes in space and to come back to the cometary nucleus to different orbits, 10, 20, 30 kilometers, or to distance, as mentioned earlier, to five kilometers. One of these instruments, Cosima, here is the clean surface. After passage of the cometary nucleus in a close distance, you see here cometary particles that that were then analyzed by the means of mass spectrometry. So now the last uh, six minutes of my presentation, we go to the Rosetta lander, which is called Philae. On Philae, we do have 10 instruments, three legs, two harpoons in the middle, ice screws to fix uh, Philae after landing, and our instrument, which is called COSAC. Inside here, a gas chromatograph coupled to a mass spectrometer. The landing ellip ellipse of Philae in 2014. This is Philae after separation from the Rosetta orbiter. The three legs were deployed. Here are two antenna. Everything is perfect. During landing, Philae started to rotate around its axis of translation, which is perfectly fine to get stabilized. This is a film which was uh, so based on a shape model, which is not the real landing sequence of this uh, film, but it, it was uh, similar to this. On the big image here, you see the cometary surface as taken by the Rosetta camera. And here, this is the Rolis camera on board Philae. You can find this image here, so we knew exactly where Philae is going to land. It was important that the, the uh, the surface where we are going to land is flat. If you have an inclination of higher than 15%, Philae would fall on its head, and the telemetry would be lost to the Rosetta orbiter, which was used as a relay station to Earth. So 20% were already uh, uh, of, of this uh, risk that Philae would fall on its head. But this is not what happened. I was in Cologne at uh, the uh, Lander Control Center on their champagne was served. Other people, such as Francois Hollande, were sitting in Paris in the Cité de, Science, de la Science. He was, uh, Francois Hollande, taken by his emotions, took the microphone and make, made a talk, gave a talk on uh, how beautiful space science are because these sciences um, combine uh, international competences, for example, in between Germany and France. And he's completely right by saying that. He could have also said, that the Rosetta mission combined knowledge 
in between different generations of scientists, which is also perfectly true. But what Francois Hollande did not see to that time is that Philae rebounced after its first landing attempt from the cometary surface. The ice screws and the harpoons did not anchor Philae. We were supposed to see a nice 360 degree panorama image after landing of the cometary nucleus, but we saw that. So Philae rebounced. This was an image before. Afterwards, here you see the imprints of the uh, three feet of Philae, but Philae itself was missing. Philae rebounced to an altitude of 500 meter. For two hours, there were several landing attempts, or yeah, landing attempts, let's call it like this, and a final position in which Philae landed on the cometary surface, which was not the position where we wanted to land. And here on this image, you see one of the feet of Philae on the lower left bottom. And this is a surface taken from a distance of 50 centimeter from what is called the perihelion cliff. And this surface structure that you see here has the age of the solar system. The age of this surface structure is 4.56 billion of years. And this is interpreted. An artist made this image. This became a cover page of nature. Here you see the three feet of Philae. Philae is called in something like a vertical position and not in a horizontal landing position that it was supposed to land. After this um, cover page of science, Philae was refound by the Rosetta orbiter. And you can see in this image that the design of the artist, which was of course uh, created, generated in close collaboration with Rosetta scientists was rather correct. Concerning our instrument, the Cossack instrument, after the final, uh, after the first touchdown, 20 minutes after the first touchdown, we received the data uh, of Cossack science. Here's our instrument, a gas chromatogram with uh, eight capillary columns, a uh, drill, which is uh, supposed to take a sample here, fill the cometary ices into these into one of these ovens. In total, we have 24 ovens. The ovens are mounted on a carousel, moved together with the cometary ice in the tapping station where they are closed and heated. And all those volatile materials move here into the gas chromatograph where they are separated one from each other and then by a transfer line into this time of flight mass spectrometer. Here you see the gas reservoir, the gas chromatograph and the time of flight mass spectrometer. 20 minutes after the first touchdown, when we were in an altitude above the cometary surface, we obtained this mass spectrum here. Two days later, we measured this one. And on 16 October, what we can use as a blank, this mass spectrum here was recorded with masses at 18 for water, 28 carbon monoxide, and 44 carbon dioxide. This mass spectrum recorded by the Cossack instrument on board Philae, detected 20 minutes after landing, uh, is uh, considerably different from those uh, blank solutions. Uh, we had this black mass spectrum here. This was recorded. The orange one is a fit that was uh, calculated and reconstructed by our team, by the Cossack team. And for this fit, we require 16 organic molecules that you can see here. So the uh, Cossack instrument detected after landing on the cometary surface, alcohols, carbon with amines, nitriles, amines, and iocyanates on the cometary surface. The amino acid glycine was detected as well by another instrument called Rosima, which was on board on the uh, Rosetta orbiter. The Rosetta story is a big success story for the European Space Agency. And uh, as a consequence, our instrument, a GC coupled to a mass spectrometer, uh, was then, let's say, invited to participate at the upcoming mission uh, of European space, European space Agency, which is called the ExoMars mission, which is going to be launched in 2022 to land on Mars in 2023. Also there, this is a steam of our instrument, which is number called COSAC, which is called MoMA for Mars Organic Molecule Analyzer, will be land uh, on Mars on a rover in 2023. This is the GC coupled to a mass spectrometer. We again will use a natural selective capillary columns. The anatoselective capillary column is this one here. 
Um, I wrote two books on this uh, endeavor, on this challenge. The one is more on chirality and amino acids. The second one focuses on the uh, comments. I thank all this team of international collaborators, the entire Rosetta team, European Space Agency, my team at the University of Nice, all the sponsors here, and I thank in particular you for your kind attention. So oh, thank you very much for this thrilling lecture. These were beautiful images in an extraordinary science. So for everybody who missed the talk or part of the talk, uh, the presentation will be uploaded to the YouTube channel of the German Chemical Society. So you can watch it again. Um, maybe we have time for two or three questions. Are there questions? So maybe I should ask a question. Um, what is the wavelength of the light you irradiated your samples? You mentioned it's UV light, but uh, is it below 200 nanometers? It must be high energy light. Okay. All these molecules don't absorb in, in uh, above 300 nanometers. Yes. For those first experiments, which were performed already prior to the launch of uh, Rosetta in 2002, we used photons of uh, 10.2 EV, which correspond to Lyman alpha, or for chemists, uh, 120 nanometer, 121 nanometer. These were our very first experiments where we identified 16 amino acids. Then we uh, moved the wavelengths or the energy of these photons to a higher wavelengths, lower energy because we wanted to detect the uh, uh, circular dichroism spectra of the amino acids in between 150 nanometer and 300 nanometer. There identify most um, intense electronic transitions, maxima and minima in circular dichroism uh, with the aim to induce an enantiomeric excess by irradiating the circularly polarized light at particular these energies. And therefore, we are at energies uh, that are at around 180 nanometers, 220 nanometers to transfer the chirality of incoming photons towards the formed amino acids. So to answer your question, we started at 120 nanometers. Now we are at 180, 220, 200. And where, where does the polarization come from in space? There, there's no polarization filter or? Uh... Sure, there's no polarization filter. Yeah, so what was important for us, chiral photons exist in space. I have shown an image on that. And the uh, astrophysicists that uh, work on that, they expect uh, me scattering on the surface of aligned dust grains that are responsible for the, uh, the chirality of the photons observed in space. Okay. So is there more left-handed or more right-handed?